should operate and evolve, with politicians as philosophers in action. My guest today seeks to revive that legacy with his new biography. He's the Conservative MP, Jesse Norman. And Jesse was one of your reasons for taking a new look at the life and works of Edmund Burke, just that you wanted to inject a bit more philosophy into what seems to be quite a managerial politics in the 21st century. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, Burke is extraordinary, not least because he's got so much relevance today. And I think one of the things that people think when they look at politicians now is, first of all, they think they're all in it for themselves, and Burke is a phenomenal exercise in kind of self-sacrifice in his own life. And then they think that um, actually it's all about a certain kind of me-first, have-it-all philosophy in sort of public life generally, and I don't think he's like that at all. But he's, his real philosophical achievement is to flesh out a way of thinking in politics which puts society first and has politicians as tasked with preserving and enhancing society and then passing it on to the next generation, not simply, it's not about me, 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 it's not about us in that generationally, as it were, self-enriching sense, it's all about what we can do for others and what we can do for those who lived after us as well as those in the present. And it, most especially it's not about having a sort of grand design where you stop with a blank sheet of parchment, write a constitution and off you go. No, that's right. He's got a great line where he talks about Lord North, uh, who was uh, the uh, Prime Minister during the American Revolutionary War. And he says, uh, he says Lord North is a man who uh, uh, rejects his experience and consults his imagination. And that's actually true about a lot of uh, politicians these days. Give us, first of all, a, a bit of a picture of the way politics work then, because we tend to think that there were Whigs and there were Tories and this was just an earlier sort of iteration of the two-party system that we uh, know and are so used to in this country. Well, there, no, there were no parties in Burke's, um, you know, when Burke came to prominence uh, in the 1760s. Um, he was really the first person uh, to get involved in the theory and the practice of building a political party. And politics at that time was very factional. Uh, it was all about certain pools of influence around the House of Commons. The king was a very important feature, figure in, in politics. And so what you tended to have was a king who decided who he wanted to be running his administration. And the person who could do that then tried to find uh, administrations that would support it, regardless of what their own personal or their own, as it were, professional or political inter interests might be. And, and the result was that you didn't have um, anything like the same rather principled mechanism whereby the people choose a party based on a manifesto or a platform, they choose their representatives uh, and uh, the modern system of which uh, when a government can no longer uh, command uh, a majority in the House in the way that it does by party, then that party falls and there's a peaceful transfer of power from one side to another. All that was completely foreign to the mid-18th century. And so into this, this very fluid parliament full of different factions with different sort of patrons at the centre of each of them comes Edmund Burke, marked out right from the start by an astounding ability to express his ideas both in words and in oratory. I mean, it's quite an underrated part of his sort of armoury of abilities and powers it was just his, his communication skills. Yes, I mean, Burke isn't really well known much now, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to represent him in a biography. Um, but when he is thought of now, he's thought of as a kind of political philosopher. Uh, but he was also a great orator and a great communicator in his own uh, era. And there's a lovely moment where uh, Boswell, James Boswell, uh, biographer of, of Dr Johnson, who says seeing Burke as it were, speaking, was like watching a man in an orchard just pulling off apples and oranges and just pelting the administration with them, um, you know, without any fear or, or, or without any absence of fertility in his imagination. He's an extraordinary figure that way, and his writing is constantly uh, readable and constantly worth revisiting. And there, there was a lot of pelting to do because Burke took on a succession of injustices. There was the uh, fiscal oppression of the American colonies, as they then were. He spoke up for them. There was his own native land of Ireland where the disadvantage that Irish Catholics in particular were, were put at by law was, was huge. There was the treatment of um, the developing empire in India and on all of those he spoke up repeatedly which must have marked him out as quite a target. Yes, I think it did. Uh, he very much um, was animated throughout his life by the detestation of 
uh, the abuse of power or of arbitrary power. And that is the great, the great melody, as it's been called, or the great thread that links all parts of his life together. And therefore, it's wrong to think of there as being a kind of um, progressive Burke when he's younger and a Tory Burke when he's older. There's really the whole thing that unites it is the hatred of, of, of the abuse of power. And the same thing is true, of course, in the French Revolution, because he thinks that the revolutionaries are abusing the power of the people um, by sw threatening to sweep away uh, French society and the French social order in pursuit of some unattainable, as he sees it, uh, ideal of, of equality or fraternity. Why didn't he think that about the American Revolution, of which he was a bit of a sympathiser? Uh, he was very much sympathised with, with the colonists, yes. Um, I mean, he felt that the colonists were essentially Englishmen abroad, and therefore to wage war on them to try to oppress the freedoms of Englishmen abroad was not merely ill-advised, because they were 3,000 miles away, it was just futile, because how could an Englishman ever... As he says, an Englishman is the unfittest man to argue another Englishman into slavery. He just thought it was a, a kind of suicide in a way for them, for us to be seeking to oppress the Americans. And what he tried to put in place and argue for in a succession of speeches was a completely different conception of empire based on a non-coercive pooling of interests and on commerce rather than on the hand of, as it were, um, the monarch uh, reaching out 3,000 miles and attempting to impose its will on the Americans um, without any kind of uh, representation in, in Parliament. But while a, a lot of his allies, who, who had been very impressed by the stance he'd taken over Ireland, over America, over India, uh, were welcoming the French Revolution when it came, you know, he, he, he was not taking the same view as the bliss it was to be alive in that dawn crowd at all. He immediately seems to have detected that there was something very different about the French Revolution Revolution, which he didn't like the look of at all. No, he is extraordinary. One of the many ways in which Burke is just such an extraordinary figure is that, um, if you can imagine, you have the Bastille Day, uh, as it now would be, but the falling of the Bastille on the 14th of July uh, in um, 16, uh, 1789, um, and it, this is regarded basically with rapture by the bien pensant, the intellectuals, the artists, in and, and many politicians in Britain, and um, uh, Charles James Fox in particular, who was the leader of the Whigs uh, at that time, was absolutely rhapsodic about it and Burke is almost alone in saying no you don't understand while everyone else is bathing themselves in self-congratulation he says you don't understand this is going to lead to bloodshed and violence and terror what and oppression not? and tyranny and war uh, not merely civil but international war and ultimately and ultimately a, 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 a dictator and of course that is precisely what happens because 15 years later he'd never knew of the existence of Napoleon when he said this in 1790 but 15 years later Napoleon has taken over not merely France but almost all of Europe. What tipped him off? Why did he spot this when so many others didn't? I mean, there are three things that are extraordinary about, about Burke. One is he has an amazing command of detail. So when he's thinking about India, he gathers all the information you possibly can and, and thinks about it. And he's an extremely good historian. He, he wrote a, an, un, an unfinished history of, uh, of, of Britain, um, which is enormously readable. It goes up to Magna Carta. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is he's got this amazingly fertile imagination. And the combination of those two things plus his flair for political change and so the social order means that his analogy in his mind is not the peaceful, broadly peaceful, English constitutional revolution of 1688. It's the English Civil War, the War of Three Kingdoms, actually, as it's often called, in 1641. And, of course, that's a completely um, disastrous um, in terms of bloodshed and violence set of events for Britain. And so he's able to look past 1688. He says this is more like 1641, and because it's like that, we can be guaranteed to see a complete disaster, and that's, of course, what happens. Because his attitude towards changing the political system was one of extreme caution. He thought that things should evolve organically rather than that someone should sit down and write a new constitution or make some great sweeping reform. And I, I can't help thinking that when you were masterminding the um, defeat of House of Lords reform a while back, that the, this was a, a very Burkean thing to be doing. <laughs> well, I mean, in a way it is, because it's, it's, it is a defence of the constitution against a very ill-advised piece of legislation that would have done the constitution great damage. Um, so there is that parallel. Um, in Burke's case, I think, 
um, he does have this historical sense, and so he's able to look back to precedents, and he's able to look back to the constitutional motives that bind the country together, and that does give him an insight that, that others are often lacking. He does seem to have some startlingly modern-sounding ideas about what we'd now call social capital, about the psychology of community, uh, about making society glue together. Uh, such ideas that, as you point out in the book, are often being vindicated by modern research. Yes, I mean, the, one of the nice things about the book is that you're able to take the biography and then extend it into thinking about the way in which we are now. And one of the things that's most striking is that there's been this great 19th century project of trying to found all of politics on science, as though the individual reason was the be-all and end-all of, of any kind of activity. And what Burke says is actually that's completely wrong. Politics is about human life. Human life is about the emotions. It's about our affinities. It's about our ideas. Identity. It's about all those things. And when you understand it's like that, you can't place it on a Procrustean bed. You can't get out your slide rule and, as it were, and measure everything and pretend that it's all going to be perfectly scientifically, um, as it were, tractable. Um, you have to understand the ebb and flow of events. You have to understand the nature of the society you're in. When you do that, you can get great insight, but you don't get it by behaving in a kind of rationalist way. And of course, he's absolutely right, because one of the things you see, and you see it now uh, as much in a way as you did even two hundred years ago is people fall in love with slogans. I mean, the average soundbite, I was told the other day, has gone down from 45 seconds in the 1960s to nine seconds now, or seven seconds. So people are wearing a soundbite culture, and that actually is disastrous because it causes people to think about abstract ideas as just single slogans rather than actually say this is something that has a history and a trajectory, it's got something, it's got accretions of institutional aspects to it, and we need to think about what it actually means in context, and then we can reflect on how best to govern on, on that basis. So if uh, Edmund Burke were to climb into the TARDIS and, and come to the 21st century, what do you think he'd make of the current convulsions over Europe? Well, I think he'd be, I think he'd be, I think he'd regard the Eurozone as a rationalist folly. I think he'd regard that as, as an enormous attempt to remake, as it were, the financial and the economic world on a blank sheet of paper. And I think he would be very sceptical about whether that could ever succeed because it tries to run roughshod over people's national affiliations. That's his whole point, is that these, these, a nation is a moral essence, as he says. People cannot be just rammed together in that kind of way. That's one thing. Another thing I think he'd be very critical of is the patterns of self-enrichment we've seen in the financial markets um, and in the international uh, yes, I, I, banks I, I, over the past few years. He would analogize that to the... To the, to the uh, um, uh, East India Company, because East India Company was running um, uh, roughshod over democratic processes in the 1770s and 80s, and he makes a heroic effort with the impeachment of Warren Hastings, who's the Governor General of India, to reach out to India to hike this back, uh, this man back to Westminster Hall, and to put him on trial in full view of hundreds and hundreds of people, and to show that private power, like public power, must be democratically accountable and legitimate in the proper channels. And, and that is a great pioneering thing to do, and we should be, in some respects, doing that with the modern nabobs of finance these days. But the, Burke also said that the laws of commerce were the laws of nature, which in turn are laid down by God, which doesn't sound like there should be a predisposition to interfere too much in the workings of the market. And a lot of people might wonder about that after no, the well, crash. Well, it's very interesting, yeah. Of course, you can read markets in one of two different ways. You can read them in what you might call a liberal or neoliberal way, in which basically people are individual economic agents and it's all about their incentives and preferences and this kind of economic vocabulary. Or you can regard them the way Smith and Burke would regard them, which is a market as a cultural embedded entity, its purpose is to solve certain problems of supply and demand, it's subject to norms and laws and internal standards, and that's how you think about markets, that's how Burke thinks about markets. And what's so fascinating is that Adam Smith, who we regard with awe and reverence as kind of the founder of economics in this modern sense, Smith said of Burke, Burke is the only man who thinks on all subjects exactly as I do without having to, uh, any discussion passing between us. So they're remarkably sim similar in their thinking on these issues. I come back to this point about philosophy today in politics today. It is a very managerial politics we've got today. And I, I get the sense that a lot of people in your party, the Conservative Party, uh, would actually like a bit more of an underpinning. I mean, are, are you essentially 
showing a bit of philosophical leg here to try and, uh, try and uh, show that you're the man to point the way. No, I'm not trying to do any of that kind. But what I am trying to do is to suggest that philosophy is... I mean, ideas are always in charge. We can, we can have this classic English distaste for philosophy as a word, but since ideas are always in charge, we might as well be a little bit clever about which ones are in charge of us insofar as we can be. And if we do that, then we do move ourselves away from this culture of soundbite and slogan and more towards a culture where people know where they're coming from from what they're trying to achieve, and therefore they can answer not just the first question about a policy, but the second and even conceivably the third question about it as well. Well, it's a fascinating revisiting of a neglected master. Jesse Norman, thanks very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. And Book Talk will be back again next week. Do join us then.